Welcome back for another video tutorial from Pilot Training Solutions. Today we're going to clarify once and for all the procedure pilots need to follow in the case of IFR lost comms. Before we start, I'd like to apologize for not having posted a new video in a while, but all of us here at PTS have been extremely busy putting the finishing touches on our newly released app the IFR Procedures app, which by the way is now available on our website and on iTunes. This video is in fact an extract from the final chapter of this latest app of ours. But without further ado, let's begin. These days losing the ability to communicate with ATC is quite uncommon. This is because most airplanes are now equipped with two radios on independent systems, such as different antennas. The most likely reason for having a radio failure would be an electrical system failure, which in IFR would cause the emergency to take a much greater significance. Another possible reason for a comms failure would be the shearing of the antennas due to ice, but again, modern antennas are quite solid and would rarely shear off because of it. The only antenna I have ever seen break is the EOT antenna, as it is very slim and fragile. If the airplane you are flying only has one radio, then the chances for a lost comm situation greatly increases. As most pilots know, plan A rarely works in aviation, so being prepared for plan B to Z never hurts. With this in mind, I think it would be wise for any pilot who's going to be flying off in an IFR conditions to purchase a handheld VHF radio and carry it with them fully charged on all flights. In any case, let's look at what procedure needs to be followed in the event of two-way radio communications failure while in IFR. The first thing you should do is, obviously, to try and troubleshoot the problem and see if the radios can be restored. Most checklists, however, do not include a procedure for a lost comm situation, so here are some helpful hints. First, consider the possibility of pilot error and check whether the comms are correctly set. Are you on the correct frequency? You might have switched to a wrong one, so try switching back to the previous frequency and communicating. Are the selectors on top of the radios correctly set? Make sure the selector knob is on the same radio as the one you're trying to communicate on. Is the volume up? Maybe you turned it down for some reason, so turn it back up, etc, etc. Second, if pilot error is not to blame, then take a look at the denunciator panel to see if the problem was caused by an electrical system malfunction. Third. In the absence of an annunciator panel, or if the annunciator panel shows no problem, take a look at the ammeter or load meter to double check whether it is an electrical system on function indeed. An ammeter would warn of an electrical system failure by indicating a negative charge, while on a load meter the needle would indicate zero. If it is indeed an electrical system on function or failure, the actions you should take are quite different. So for that, jump forward to the total electrical failure slide. Fourth. If you have determined that the problem is not electrical in nature, the next step would be to check the circuit breakers and reset them if they were triggered. Keep in mind that if the circuit breakers popped, there could be an underlying electrical problem after all, so you should keep a close eye on it and if the breakers popped again, then you should advise ATC and land ASAP. Fifth, try switching the radios off and on again and do the same with the master switch. Your final step should be to try switching to the emergency frequency of 121.5 and see if you're able to communicate on that. Now, if you were unable to restore the radios, then the procedure to follow is to first set the transponder code to 7600. This is extremely important as it will notify TC immediately of the problem and allow them to lend you a hand, if nothing else, by clearing the airspace around you. Keep in mind that the purpose of most of the regulations that cover IFR flying is to aid pilots and ATC in the case of a lost communication scenario. Ever wondered why you have to follow so many procedures when selecting a route to file? The answer is simple. In a lost comm scenario, ATC will know exactly what you will be doing from the moment you lose the radios to the time you land. The rest of the procedure you should follow is clearly listed in FAR 91.185. First of all, if the failure occurs in VFR conditions, or if VFR conditions are encountered after the failure, each pilot shall continue the flight under VFR and land as soon as possible. If instead the failure occurs in IFR conditions, each pilot shall continue the flight according to the following. And for that, remember these two acronyms, Avenue F for the route and MEA for the altitude. Meaning, for the route, continue flying the route based on this order. A for assigned 
or by the root assigned by ATC in the last clearance you received. V for vectored. If being radar vectored by the direct route from the point of the radio failure to the fix root or airway specified in the vector clearance. So if for example ATC advised you to fly 270 to intercept the 150 radio to Sparta, lose comms, fly direct to Sparta. E stands for expected. In the absence of an assigned route, by the route that ATC has advised may be expected in a further clearance. Or F for filed. In the absence of an assigned route, or a route that ATC has advised may be expected in a further clearance, by the route you filed on your flight plan. For the altitude, you shall fly the highest of the following altitudes or flight levels for the route segment being flown. M for MEA, the minimum altitude converted if appropriate to minimum flight level as prescribed in 91-121 for IFR operations. E for expected, the altitude or flight level ATC has advised may be expected in a further clearance. A for assigned, the altitude or flight level assigned in the last ATC clearance received. So if the MEA was 8,000 feet and ATC told you to climb to 10,000 and expect 12,000 in 10 minutes, you should immediately climb to 12,000 because it is the highest of the three. Once you reach your clearance limit, you may leave it only when, exactly as stated by the FARs, if the clearance limit is a fix from which an approach begins, you can commence descent or descent and approach as close as possible to the expect further clearance time if one has been received or if one has not been received, as close as possible to the estimated time of arrival as calculated from the filed or amended with ATC estimated time en route. If the clearance limit is not a fix from which an approach begins, leave the clearance limit at the expect further clearance time if one has been received, or if none has been received, upon arrival over the clearance limit and proceed to a fix from which an approach begins and commence descent or descent and approach as close as possible to the estimated time of arrival as calculated from the filed or amended with ATC estimated time in room. This, translated into plain English, means if ATC gave you an expect for and clearance time, leave the limit at that time. In the absence of an EFC time, leave the limit at the estimated time of arrival, the ATA, calculated by adding your flight plan's time in route to the actual departure time. For example, if you departed at 12 Zulu and entered 2 hours and 30 minutes in your flight plan's estimated time in route box, you may leave the limit at 1430 Zulu. If you amended the estimated time in route with ATC, and they acknowledged obviously, you can leave the limit at this amended time, calculated again by adding it to the actual departure time. So using the same example as before, if let's say you departed at 12 Zulu and entered 2 hours and 30 minutes in the flight plan's estimated time in route box, but then you advised ATC that the flight would only take 2 hours instead of 2.5 hours. In this case, you may leave the limit at 14 Zulu instead of 14.30. The limit itself is a fix that is generally dictated by the flight plan you filed. It is the last fix entered in the root box of the flight plan. If you filed an initial approach fix, which I strongly recommend you always do, then once at the EFC or ETA, you can commence descent or descent and approach. If you filed something other than an initial approach fix, then you're looking at two possible scenarios. The first one is where ATC gave you an EFC time for that fix in which case you would have to hold there until said EFC time expires. Then proceed to the initial approach fix where you would hold again until the ATA, after which you may finally continue on to the approach and land. The second scenario is when not assigned an EFC time by ATC. In this case, the limit you filed is not the actual limit anymore. Once you reach your filed limit, you need not to hold there but rather continue on to the final approach fix where you would hold until the ETA and then proceed on the approach and land. Let's look at a couple of examples to clear things up a bit and we'll use the flight plan from KMMU to KMGJ. First scenario, the final fix on your route was SAX, which as you can see from the approach plate is indeed an initial approach fix for the ILS runway 3 to the destination. You entered 35 minutes for your time en route and your actual departure time was 11.25. The last clearance from ATC before experiencing lost comms was to climb to 3,000 feet and expect 4,000 in 10 minutes and proceed on a heading of 270's vectors for Sparta. So, lost comms verified and all procedures done, 
first we immediately turn and fly direct to Sparta and also immediately climb to 4,000 feet. Remember, if being radar vectored by the direct route from the point of radio failure to the fixed route or airway specified in the vector clearance, and also fly the highest between the minimum route altitude expected or assigned. Once at Sparta, we will need to hold there until the ETA of 12 Zulu. This was given by adding the estimated time in route or ETE of 35 minutes to the actual departure time of 1125. So, let's say that at 11.40 we arrive at Sparta on a bearing to the station of 360, the 180 radio from Sparta. We will need to hold there until 12 Zulu. How? The easiest way possible, meaning pretend you are already established on the hold as you arrive at the station. So again, arriving at the station on a 360 bearing, make a standard turn, a right turn, to 180 for the outbound and so on. If you had received a holding clearance from ATC, it would have been November 123 Papa Tango, hold southeast of Sparta on the 180 radio, expect further clearance at 12 Zulu. In other words, whatever bearing you arrive to the station or fix on becomes your hold's inbound leg. You will make standard right turns and continue holding until your destination's ETA. At the ETA, we will leave Sparta on its 042 radio and start descending to 3000 feet. We intercept the localizer and continue the approach as you would normally do. Second scenario, we're actually arriving from the west and the final fix on our route was Huguenot. Again, as you can see, that is not an initial approach fix for the ILS runway 3 to the destination. You also entered 1 hour and 35 minutes for your time in route and your actual departure time was 11.25. The last clearance from ATC before experiencing lost comms was to climb to 3,000 feet, expect 5,000 in 10 minutes and proceed on a heading of 050 vectors for Huguenot. So, first we again immediately turn and fly direct to Huguenot and also immediately climb to 5,000 feet. Same scenario as before. If being radar vectored by the direct route from the point of radio failure to the fix, route or airway specified in the vector clearance, and also you shall fly the highest between the MEA, expected or assigned. If we were given an EFC time for Huguenot, we would hold there until its expiration. But because we were not given an EFC time, once at Huguenot we would proceed to an initial approach fix for the ILS. Now, as we can see, there are multiple IAFs for the ILS runway 3 to MGJ. For example, Sparta and Dyad. Which one should we proceed to? And maybe now you understand that it would have been simpler if we just filed an IAF to start with, as I suggested earlier. In any case, because the FARs do not specify any procedure for selecting the IAF to proceed to, the choice is up to the pilot. I would pick the IAF based on the time I arrive at Huguenot. If close to the ETA, say within 10 minutes, I would proceed to diet and then execute the procedure turn outbound for the approach. Keep in mind that per regulations I would not start my descent from 5000 feet until the actual ETA expired. If my ETA was greater than 10 minutes, I would probably consider proceeding to Sparta where I could hold until the expiration of the ETA and follow the exact same procedure mentioned on the previous slide. I have attended many safety seminars, and every time an ATC controller was one of the speakers, he suggested that the best procedure to follow once you reach your clearance limit is to immediately initiate the approach without waiting for the FC time or ETA. Their point is always, we know you're there, we have already cleared the airspace for you, so the sooner you land, the better for us. Now this might be true, but I always argue with them that doing as they suggest would be in direct violation of the FARs. If something went wrong, it would not be their butt on the line. It would be the pilot's, in other words, mine. So if you have also been given this advice by ATC, I suggest you disregard it and follow the actual rules. One last consideration. If the weather at the file destination airport forces you to go missed, the rules allow you to do as you please. Even if you actually filed an alternate airport, nothing in the FARs mentions that you need to proceed there next. So what should you do? Well, whatever is best. If you know of nearby VFR conditions, go there. If you want to shoot the same approach again, well then do so, etc, etc. Because of this freedom, I suggest that while flying to your destination, you try and keep track of the weather at the various airports. 
and use that information to make your decision on where to go in case you're forced to go missed at your destination. Well, thanks for watching, and don't forget to visit PassFAExams.com to see how we can help you ace all of your aviation exams while helping you become a much safer and more knowledgeable pilot.